Senator yeah. Campbell has a supplementary here. Yes. I, I was just yeah, going to point know. out in the interests of editorial fairness that uh, yeah. it has been referred to as the Swedish myth by uh, another, uh, another witness, and it was referred to as a failure by someone uh, who is most certainly lacking in scientific quality, although not lacking in investigative quality. So I believe that it is, it is a myth until somebody with some scientific science behind it uh, appears before us. Sweden is also, to be fair, a very different society than Canada. Sweden is much more homogenous than Canada, has much, much less poverty than Canada. You know, I mean, our serious drug problems are concentrated among our poor and marginalized. Sweden has nowhere near the composition of poverty versus wealth that Canada has. So Portugal would be a better comparison to the Canadian population. You. Well, I, I, I don't know that I would go that far. No, I, I, I think I the more interesting thing about what, ha what happened in Portugal is the upward spike in demand for treatment. I think that's what you want to, what, what you want to investigate. Right. And like, it, I think the lesson from Portugal was that when, when all drugs were decriminalized, people feared, they, they, they had less anxiety about seeking treatment. Right. And because more treatment was available, there was a demand for a greater demand for treatment. And when, when demand for treatment spikes up, that means that incidence of opportunistic or economic compulsive crime trends downward. So Glenn Greenwald will tell you, I'm sure, unless you know, things have changed dramatically, that all the normal, all, all the important indicators, particularly prevalence and lifetime use, are trending downward in Portugal. And that's what we want. <coughs> Madam Chair, I, I realize my time's running long. It is I, indeed. I, I, I realize. Way I, to over time. Yeah. We still have more witnesses to I know. There is one further question I would like to ask if I could. Very All right. tight. All right. It, it is a question. Uh, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Jones, look, I was looking through your, I had read your, your brief, and at uh, page six is the following statement. So discredited is the concept of mandatory minimum sentences for drug-related crimes in particular that even New York State's Rockefeller drug laws, the template for American experiment in mass incarceration, have been repealed. Your, your brief then goes on to say, key to the amendments in the repeal of the Rockefeller drug laws is eliminating mandatory minimum sentences, precisely the opposite of what Bill C-15 proposes to enact. So you're obviously drawing a comparison between the Rockefeller drug laws and Bill C-15. Uh, it seems you are. But my understanding is the Rockefeller drug laws instituted mandatory minimum penalties of 15 years to life for simple possession of over four ounces of narcotics. I'm wondering, first of all, is that correct? And if it is, how could that ever be taken as a, uh, an appropriate basis on which to discredit uh, Bill C-15? Well, doesn't seem to be comparable at all. Senator, I, I, what, what I'm trying to draw attention to is the mechanism of mandatory minimums themselves, mm -hmm. not the precise fine-tuning details, but this, the idea that drug users and drug traffickers respond to deterrence-based sentencing. There is no evidence for it, and what evidence exists argues in the opposite direction. And I've submitted, I think, or at least I asked uh, Jessica, to, uh, to reprint an article from Michael Tonry, the current issue of crime and justice research. I mean, somebody, if, if there's evidence that mandatory minimum sentences work for drug laws, why doesn't somebody bring it forward? Why doesn't, of all people, the minister lay it on the table for you? Or send it to me? I'd love to see it. I think we have here, as between Senator Wallace and Mr. Jones, a clash uh, of titans. Uh, a clash of <laughs> titans. And, uh, and well, I'm just being educated by Mr. Jones. Well, I'm not with points him. points of view on either side. Not favorably, but I'm being educated. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to go that far, John. <laughs> Mr. Jones, thank you very well, much. May, may, may I? May I uh, Colleagues, order. Uh, Senator Carignan asked a question uh, of of uh, Mr. Sapers that Mr. Sapers was uh, unable to respond to. Indeed, and so, we said we'd get back to and you. May, yes. may I please uh, correct the yes. record on that one? Okay. So the question is, in the great natural experiment to the south, they have enacted mandatory minimum sentences for every conceivable kind of crime for which they are currently trying to back out of, right? Very high. high. Very high. Not and they don't work, okay? It's a oh, yeah. So the question is, and they also have the world's 
highest rate of incarceration, okay? These things are stipulated. The question is, why aren't there even more people in the United States than they currently have? And the answer is found in this, in this little one-page thing that I forwarded that I called homeostatic equilibrium. And this, Senator Wallace, is something that I think you should be very concerned about. And that is the tendency for criminal justice actors to subvert the intention of this legislation by negotiating closed-door deals to harshen the impact of minimum sentences. We've heard a lot in this, in this justice legislation about truth in sentencing. And the idea, as I understand it, is that mandatory minimum sentences will bring transparency and accountability to sentencing. But the evidence from the United States is not, is that the, the opposite happens. That criminal justice actors, in, I'm talking about prosecutors, police, judges, in order to preserve proportionality and fairness in sentencing, subvert the impact of minimum, uh, mandatory minimums by negotiating closed door bargains to reduce the impact of sentencing or by charging down so that individuals do not have to, conf to face mandatory minimum sentences. So it's the very opposite of truth in sentencing. And I think you, sh you really need to take seriously this notion that what happens is that discretion is not removed but simply displaced. Okay? That's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Colleagues, I sh uh, well, just one second, if you don't mind, Senator Nona. The, uh, the article that Mr. Jones had asked the clerk to print out is, in fact, one that we appended to our proceedings at the beginning of this evening's meeting, and that is the one entitled The Mostly Unintended Effects of Mandatory Penalties, Two Centuries of Consistent Findings by Michael Tonry. Senator Nolan, last words from Mr. So if, I, if, I, if I understand you cor correctly, if we would carve a, an amendment to bring back the discretion the judge already have under the, the, the CDSA would, would be fine. To the extent that you can put new propellers on the Titanic. Well, the only thing we can do is to amend the I know, thing. I understand that, Senator. I understand uh, that. Yes, uh, I, I, I happen to think that our judges do a pretty good job. Even the, even the minister said that in C-25. He had total confidence in the judges, so that's why. So then bringing forward legislation to limit the discretion of judges seems like a contradiction. It does not introduce fairness. It does not introduce truth in sentencing. It seems like a step backward to me. And now I'm going to thank Mr. Jones very much Thank indeed.